Oh, Jack, so good morning, everyone. So we will continue from what we did yesterday. We start with uh, this section here, uh, rational polyhedral cones. Then from yesterday, we are going to start with the lattice N. This is just isomorphic to Zn. And then we have the dual, like home from N to Z, which we denote by M. And then we are going to get vector spaces by tensoring with R. So we tensor the lattice N, which is again just Zn with R. It gives us something isomorphic to Rn. We just didn't pick a basis in principle. This will happen if you pick a basis. And then we denote it by N with a subindex R. And the same for M. Tensoring with R, and you can see that those are still dual. Okay. Yesterday, we were working with cones in Rn and just in R. It's just a copy of Rn, just without a basis chosen. So everything carries through, er, carries over. So everything that we said yesterday about cones in Rn, we get uh, for cones in N sub R, just because it's the same, it's, they are isomorphic. Okay. Now, we are going to use the extra ingredient that we have is that we have this distinguished uh, free abelian group of finite rank N inside NR. We could say that we already had that in Rn, we had a Zn. So we are going to use just this one, uh, this lattice, to introduce an extra definition. We are going to say that the cone is rational, a rational polyhedral cone if those elements from yesterday, S, that generate our cone, are from the lattice. So if you think of the version from before with a chosen uh, set of coordinates, you are just saying that we are working inside Rn and that you choose uh, your generators of the cone from Zn. And it would be equivalent to choose them from Qn because you can scale and you would not change the cone. So that's why we put here the word rational, because we are working with Zn, but really you could have worked with Qn, so rational. OK, so let me go back to a couple of slides to show you two examples. We say that the cones in examples 1, 8 and 1, 10 from yesterday are rational. And then I'll go there for a second. Those guys are over here. Um, 1, 8 is this one. These are the generators. So you see they are rational with the definition we just gave. The generators of the cone uh, are coming from uh, Qn, even here even better, Zn. And 110 is over here. One more. These two guys. Those are rational. They you see over here the generators of this one, and for this one is this one, and this one that has coordinates one mi minus one, one. So that's rational as well. So very good. Uh, these ones we talked about yesterday, strongly convex. So those cones didn't have any linear subspaces of positive dimension inside. And now we are adding rational to those. And those are the ones that we are going to use to get some toric varieties. One nice thing that happens when you add the word rational is that we have a uniquely determined minimal uh, generating set. How is that going to happen? Well, uh, from yesterday, we were looking at some cones looking like this, for example. And then looking like this. So we said, well, we have some set of generators. Say that I pick one in this ray, I pick one in this ray, and I pick one in this ray. But we said, well, if you don't like this one, just scale it a tiny bit and put it over here and remove that one and take that one instead. That one works just as well. Like I generate the exact same cone scaling any of uh, my generators. But what we are saying now is that there is going to be a way over here 
to choose them uniquely under the rational assumption. How is that going to happen? Well, uh, we use this that one can show is that if your cone is rational polyhedral, one can show that the faces are all rational. And the same is true for the dual, it's also rational polyhedral. Then, now we look at a ray. Well, this ray, let's choose coordinates to make it more intuitive. This ray over here is defined over Q. The entries of uh, a generating vector are in Q, are rational numbers. So you can scale and uh, change the generator to actually be integers without changing anything over that ray. Now, intersect that ray with the integers, with Zn. If you intersect that ray, say that I call that ray rho, and we consider rho intersected Zn, it looks like this. It would look just like a copy of um, the non-negative integers. You'd be just isomorphic to that. Then it will have a first integral point along that ray. So that is the one that we can choose. There is a way to choose it uniquely. The unique generator of that semigroup is a semigroup isomorphic to the non-negative integers. Choose the one of that semigroup. And we do that for each ray. That's allowing us to improve what we had yesterday is a minimal set of generators that is now unique. Thus, we have now discussed all of these. Very good. So please let me know if there are any questions about that. And after that, I'll move to the next slide. Very good. Then now we get this extra uniqueness over here. For the ones of maximal dimension, we were saying over there, like yesterday, that if we look at the dual, which is also a polyhedral cone of maximal dimension and is rational, according to what we said a moment ago, you have these minimal generators for, um, now this sigma dual lives in M. We have a unique choice of minimal generators for that one. Again, doing the same. You look over the rays and pick the first integral point on those rays. And then what we get over here, using one proposition from yesterday, is that our cone is the intersection of these half spaces. Yesterday we said, OK, we have this intersection of half spaces, but there was the possibility of scaling over here. But now we have a way to choose one of those uh, scaled versions. And I remind you that these UIs, in the result from yesterday, were the facet normals, the facet normals, I'm sorry. The inner pointing facet normals. And then uh, we are going to use the following definition when we study which toric varieties are normal. Or if you know this word, like also Q factorial, meaning like uh, veil divisors have a multiple that is Cartier. Uh, those are the ones that are going to be simplicial. So let's do these definitions right now. If you have one cone like the ones we are considering, so this list of adjectives over there, so the cone is polyhedral, so it's, it has this finitely, uh, finite generating set, is rational, meaning that finite generating set is, it comes from entries in the rational numbers or in the integers if you like, and if you are not choosing coordinates, they come from n or from n tens or q if you like, is a convex cone, and it's strongly convex, meaning doesn't contain linear subspaces. For one of those, we say it is regular. If the minimal set of generators is part of a basis of uh, N. And we are going to say it's simplicial. If that same thing, the minimal set of generators, is part of a basis of in R as vector space. Yes, please. By the basis, do you mean that it is linearly independent or just as it stands as 
as a module, uh, as a Z module. So then those guys should, uh, you should be able to reach every single, you should be able to reach every element of your N by adding and subtracting uh, points in your cone. So, uh, no points in your cone, let me take that back. You have, let me give you uh, the easiest example to clarify the definition. If I take, let me change the color over here. Say that I take the first quadrant generated by E1 and E2. I can write every single point in Z2 as a, an integer times this one plus an integer times this one. So I can write everybody as A times A1 plus B times E2. Let me do one more example, just not taking it, um, you're changing a little bit, say E1, and then let me put over here um, E1 plus E2. The same is true for this one. So if I take this guy and this guy, I am able to write every element of Z2 as a number, an integer number of times this one plus an integer number of times this one. And uh, I want them to be not just being able to write it, but like the, as many as the dimension, like a basis in the sense of a free module. This one is a free, is part of, so I'm not assuming that it's full dimensional, so this picture say that it could be happening in three dimensions, and this is just part of the three dimensional picture, this two dimensional cone lives in three dimensions, but uh, these two, for this one and this one, can be extended say with a perpendicular one coming upward, say with E3, to a basis of uh, Z3, so then this one would satisfy the definition. And the other one is easier to, to think about because uh, R over R, I just need that these guys are linearly independent. If that's what you were asking. Like the Z1 is not just linearly independent. The R1 is exactly that. Yes. Very good, please. So maybe can you give us an example of something that is not regular? Uh, for one not regular, yes. I even, it should maybe come over here. Let me find one ah, easy way to... Okay. One easy way to violate it would be, for example, to violate both, both of them, which would be not taking the right number of generators. So for the second one, to violate simplicial, take the cone from a moment ago that was span, was in 3D, but spanned by four vectors. So these minimal generating vectors are not a basis because they don't have the right number. Simplicial not regular, yes. Let's do one of those. Like, let me just move above, w upwards once, one point. Uh, change to be this guy and this guy. And my new cone is this and this. And who is the new guy? Is E1 plus 2E2. We can see that these two guys, E1, E1 together with E1 plus 2E2 cannot be a basis of Z2. For example, if I add a number, an integer number of times the first one of them plus an integer number of times the other one, I'm always even in the second coordinate. So I'm in trouble over there, so it, this is not a basis. So that's, for example, simplicial because these two guys are a basis of R2 but they are not a basis of the module Z2. So that one is an example of what we just wanted. Very good. So let me go back to the pictures from a moment ago, 1.8 and 1.10, which give some examples with some of these properties. Um, the cone in 1.8 is neither, and the cone in 1.10 has both. So let me just go and remind you of those guys. So this one is neither, it's easy to see because it has the wrong number of like generators. It has four, 
but this, this thing is uh, three-dimensional, so over, over there I'm already in trouble. This is not going to give me a basis of R3 or a basis of Z3. And the other ones, the ones in 110, these ones work nicely. You take this guy and this guy. That those guys give you a basis of R2 as vector space, as a real vector space, and of Z2 as module as well. And the same, this one and this one, this one would be like 1, 0, and this would be like minus 1, 1. That works as well. You can see that you can write everybody, and it has, I mean, and in a unique way. It's a basis as a Z module. Very good. So then now we talk about this one. Say, hey, finally, like we can, yeah, I'm so happy we got to this one now. So how do we get varieties out of this? Something that is going to be essential for us is to remember this, that if we have a domain, an integral domain, that is a finally generated uh, algebra over our fields, which for these lectures we are taking the complex numbers, so again, a domain that is finally generated as a C algebra, then we have an associated affine variety. We are, and this corresponding is functorial, and it has lots of nice properties. We are going to use that uh, in the next few slides. So let's start with one of these nice cones. So the cone is going to be rational polyhedral. Let me go back and make this. It's a rational polyhedral cone. And then we are going to consider the following. Uh, take this dual and then take the lattice points inside the dual in maybe a relatively easy to draw example is that if we start with the first quadrant, the dual is easy. That's why I'm choosing that one. Is this first quadrant again? If this is sigma, this is sigma dual. And then what we are doing over there is that we are intersecting and taking the integral coordinate points inside that dual. So that is the semi group that we want to consider. That's this guy. You start from your cone, you take dual, and then you intersect with the points with integral coordinates. If you are not choosing a basis, we are intersecting them with M. M again is just a copy of Zn. Then this is a semigroup under addition. Well, we are intersecting two semigroups over here, so it's a semigroup. And then inside a bigger semigroup, so this works. And then zero is the unit. And then this one that was in the practice problems from yesterday, maybe you guys have already seen the, the proof. It says the following. Um, if we have a cone, let me say it's slightly different from what it says over there. If we have a rational polyhedral cone, and then you take the integral points inside that, it is always, uh, as, a, as a subgroup, it is finally generated. As a semi-group, I'm sorry. As a semi-group, it is finally generated. And now here, in this way that this is stated, is being applied to the dual of sigma. So you can think of the statement either like, oh, first take dual, and then the integral points inside that is a finally generated semi-group, or think it without applying dual. Like every time you have a rational polyhedral cone, and you take the integral points inside, that's a semi-group. And it's not too crazy. It's finally generated. Um, if you are thinking like, oh, could we just see a quick example of something non-finally generated? Like certainly, if you take, for example, the points where um, both coordinates x and y are positive and zero, this and just going all the way, you go to infinity in both directions. Like all the points in the first quadrant that have both uh, x and y positive integer and in addition zero, this is a semi-group and it's not finally generated, one can see. Like a hint would be that suppose that you have a finite set of generators, uh, zero is not needed, so just take the other ones and then look at the slopes of all of those guys and take the minimum of those finitely many slopes. There are 
points in the same e group with a smaller slope because the slopes don't reach zero but um, have the limit zero. So you have a smaller slope than a positive number that was the minimum of the positive slopes. And then you can see that you cannot reach those because uh, any combination with positive integer coefficients of these guys uh, has a slope that is greater or equal than the smallest. That's an outline of why that semigroup that I just stated is not finally generated. But like Gordon's lemma is telling us you are not in a bad situation like that. If you have your cone and you take dual and then you take the lattice points inside that, meaning the points with integral coordinates, you are not in a bad case like this. In a good case, the points in red form a semi-group, meaning you can add those guys over there, and it is finally generated. So every point in there uh, can be expressed as a sum of certain finitely many generators that you choose, a sum with non-negative integer coefficients. Very good. So what steps have we done up to now? We started with our sigma, and then we passed to sigma dual, and then after sigma dual, we did sigma dual intersected M. Okay, now what are we going to do? The next step is to take this construction uh, called the semigroup algebra associated to that one, the semigroup algebra. So as a vector space, this one, is a vector space with the semigroup as the basis. And then to make it a little bit less confusing, um, the basis elements come from the semigroup. But if we denote them just like the elements of the semigroup, one can get confused. So one introduces this notation. If you have an element of the semigroup, there is a basis element as vector space of your semigroup algebra. We are going to denote this as the le Greek letter chi raised to the power that element that you had. So what are we just saying? We are saying that this one is a vector space that has as a basis elements that look like chi to the m where m comes from s sub sigma, meaning it's an element on m, but also in sigma dual. And we are going to give this a little bit more structure. We are going to make it an algebra. It's, uh, maybe some of you are very familiar with this construction. We are going to make it an algebra by doing the following. The elements look like this, right? Because we just said that the chi to the m's are a basis as a vector space. So any element looks like that. We need to define multiplication. So we are going to force distributivity. And after that, the only thing that we need to define is how do you multiply chi to the m with another one, with a chi to the m prime. So it is defined as follows. You just add the exponents in the semigroup. Maybe some of you are very familiar with this, and if you are not, uh, we can talk a little bit about some examples, and I think you will see that many uh, rings that you consider just arise this way. So, uh, yes, please. Chi being just a yes. Uh, we could have just written M, and but we might get confused because we use M also when we are dealing with the, the lattice and all of that then I think it's a good idea to have a, just a different symbol and just like add some decoration to the M. And the standard way to do it is that people write the Greek letter chi to the M. It's the standard for semigroup algebra. Very good. And then maybe before we continue, I can mention here on the side one example of this. Like in the one that I was doing above, what would this give us? If we intersect with um, the integer coordinates, this quadrant, we get 
this point, what I claim is that you, in that case, get just the polynomial ring in two variables. And how would the identification be? You identify chi to the ij, you identify this one with x to the i, y to the j. You see, what you have over here is expressions that are uh, sums of things looking like this. And it's the same that what you have in the other side. And the multiplication is the same, because when you multiply x to the i, y to the j with x to the i prime, y to the j prime, the exponents add on the x, the exponents add on the y, and the same thing happens on this side. If I was to multiply with another one of those, say that said chi to the i prime j prime, this would be just like x to the i prime y to the j prime, and then you see that the multiplication of these two and the multiplication of these two still correspond under this identification. And one more quick example would be that if I was to do it for the whole set of integral points, like z2, like this, sorry, should be more like here. The claim is that uh, semigroup algebra of this z2 would just be c with, I need, I have this guy over here that also I have the negative of it. So since those guys behave like the exponents, I put an x and an x minus 1 over here. Uh, I guess I, I meant these two first and the, those two afterwards. So y and y minus 1. My claim is that this one is just this one. How do you verify this same identification from over here? Chi to the ij, identify it with x to the i, y to the j, and then you see that the, uh, it gives you uh, isomorphism of vector spaces, and then you see how you multiply them, and you see that the multiplication corresponds under the identification, so it's actually an isomorphism of C algebras. Very good. So now, notice that this is the unit. The multiplicative unit is chi to the element 0 of your uh, semigroup. And when can you invert one of these guys? You can invert it if and only if you also have minus m over there. Because you can put this in a bigger place, like inside, we'll see it in a second, you can put it over here, and that would be the inverse over there. So that inverse is forced to be necessarily chi to the minus m. If there was an inverse, it has to be this guy, and that one is in our semigroup exactly when, uh, I mean, this one is in the algebra precisely when this one is in the semigroup. Okay, that's something that is, will be important for us in a moment. Then, now we can make, the, we can make this observation. If our semigroup uh, is finally generated, and those ones are giving us the exponents in the monomials, then also these monomials I can produce with a, finally, with a finite set of them, just taking chi to the generators of the semigroup, allow me to get every monomial by multiplication. And then we can see that once we allow the possibility of taking uh, linear combinations, we reach every single element of the algebra. What are we saying? That this Gordon's lemma over here tell, tells us that from this finite generation, we get finite generation for this one as a C algebra. And now, let's see what happens if we choose coordinates. Let's choose coordinates for n. So then we are just working with Zn, exactly as I pointed out in a, a moment ago in the two-dimensional case. We can see that in this case, what you get is um, the localization of the polynomial ring in n variables in the product of the variables, meaning you get like T1 and T1 inverse, 
the n to the n inverse for these n variables, and then we get an inclusion of this one here. We get an inclusion of this one here. So then our procedure again has been as follows. Start from sigma, then pass to sigma dual, then intersect sigma dual with m. Then after that, go to the semigroup algebra. And then we are just uh, verifying over here that this uh, S sigma is the same as sigma dual intersected M. We are verifying over here that it's inside this domain. This one is a domain because it's a localization of a domain. And then over here we have um, that it's an integral domain and it's, a finite, it's finally generated as uh, C algebra. I don't know what happened there. It's finally generated as a C algebra. Then we use this that I told you from the beginning. We get an um, algebraic variety, an affine variety associated to this. So let's go and do so below. This one is an integral domain because it's a subalgebra sub -algebra of this integral domain. We now know finite generation. Then we can make the following definition. Given sigma, that is a strongly convex rational polyhedral cone, you go through these steps. This one that you obtain at the end is a domain that is finally generated as a C algebra. Then there is an affine variety associated to it, uh, up to isomorphism. Uh, I'm using this notation just as for that correspondence. So don't, don't worry if you are not familiar with, um, with what this means. I'm just using it for the correspondence uh, between domains that are finally generated as C algebras and affine varieties. With the correspondence, we get an affine variety. And we are going to call it the affine toric variety associated to sigma. I guess we still need to verify that it is a toric variety in the sense that we defined. But I guess for now, the name would be the claim that needs to be checked. Then that's the set of steps. Let me then add one more arrow over here. Yes, of course, please. What does that index n represent? Very good. Let me. This one over here. That and the one above here. Very good. These two. Let me check that is not a typo. Um, this one we want um, is whatever I call the dimension. That's what I need to be using. So um, let me see the let. I think it's n, but. Um, I think I'm using n for the dimension. So it's fine. It's not these guys. Right. Yes. It's Very good. Yes, it's whatever I was calling the dimension, which I think is n. Yeah, it's, it's not this one. Yeah, because the semigroup of uh, integral points inside the dual has a finely generating set, but it might not be uh, as many elements as the dimension. An easy example is the one that I gave a moment ago. Uh, well, I'm not taking dual in this case. Let me just write the semigroup. It would be like this. Uh, to generate the semigroup, I need this guy, I need this guy, and I need this guy. So it is not, yeah, it's not, there will be r if it's 3 in this case, and n is 2. So the dimension many. Very good. Thanks a lot for asking. Yes. If I don't have any invertible element in a sigma, let me think what you mean by that. Because like the constants are invertible. So and you mean, like for example, let me see uh, to, for me to try to understand. Let's start with the easy case that we were looking a moment ago, where the only invertible ones, I guess, are going to be the constants. Like if you start with this sigma, like the first quadrant, and we take dual, it would be again this guy over here. And then when we intersect with uh, the integers, we are going to get z greater or equal than 0 cross z greater or equal than 0. Then we pass to the semigroup algebra. We are going to get the polynomial ring in two variables. The only stuff that is invertible over there would be the constants. And then I still get a variety because this will give me c2. Like when I take the polynomial ring in two variables, the corresponding affine variety to that one is C2. So I was able to do it in the case where the only invertible things are the, um, the constants. 
And that's, those ones are invertible always, I guess, right? Very good. Yes, please. I don't, but what happens is if you don't get that, um, you will get an extra factor of C star. And then, I mean, some of the statements need that, but I, the definition would still make sense. And you will, for example, um, we, we can, maybe I can include some examples of what would happen or whatever is, like the definitions carry through, apart, there are a, couple of statements that are in the in the statement you see the property and then for those is required but uh, you could give the definitions and go through with those there you go. I think it's a very good question for example you could uh, for projective toric varieties those start for those one can get from a polytope and in, in that picture you for example would not pass to the dual so for example in in that picture you could um we will get over there uh, i will not be here <laughs> but uh if you have a polytope let me just find a little bit of clean space to write i have a little bit over here so say that our polytope sits over here it doesn't matter where it sits at around each face for example, let me do it for a vertex. You translate to the origin and look at the semigroup that you have over here. And then in this picture, you would not be looking at dual. You would be looking just at the integral points inside this one. And, but you were asking, hey, why are you looking at this picture of the duals rather than just working with the original cones? I guess the answer is the following. When you have your variety, just by looking at the structure of the variety, you look at the one parameter subgroups and you look at the characters. And then those give you N and M. And then you ask, um, there is a theorem of Sumihiro that when you have some normal varieties with a torus action, then they are covered by affine uh, invariant uh, subvarieties. And then for each of those, you ask uh, which ones of the semigroups in the torus extend with a limit in there that gives you a collection of cones and that one one shows that they fit nicely they fit nicely in the sense that um, that collection that you get from over there is close and they're taking face and any two of them uh, meet at a face that collection is so nice that one gives a name it's called a fan we're going to see it over here and then since it is just so nice people like to work with this picture the picture of a fan but then the ones of the semigroups are not those. The ones of the semigroups are the ones of the characters. So then people, since these ones fit nicely, people like to work with these ones and then take dual to get the ones that give you the algebras. If you omit these ones, then you don't see the, this nice picture of the fan. So I think that's the reason. You want this nice picture of the fan uh, because it gives you lots of understanding. For example, in, an exam in something we're gonna see in a moment ago, you will understand P2 just by looking at the fan is not, it forces you to have this space, this step of taking dual, but the original collection allows you to see what the variety looks like. I'll, I'll get to that example hopefully in a moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking, Jonathan. Any more questions? Ah, Manuel. So, so maybe the related to what just uh, Jonathan asked, so, so well, I'm, I'm actually, but I, I think one important thing here is that, that you start with a strongly stronger rational bond, sigma, but when you do the dual, maybe the, the strongly is lost, right? But so then you can have the inverse. And this, this is a feature that, that you have there in, in Tori Marietti. Actually, it's going to happen in example 130. Very good. Maybe Jose is going to explain it, right? Yes, we are going to get to that one in a second. Thanks a lot. And, and I, I think that's, that's kind of important. And Very good. Then, thanks a lot. Then, uh, moving to this one right now. Uh, the following examples, the following examples of uh, affine toric varieties, in the following examples of affine toric varieties, we take n and m, so we're going to fix coordinates, and we're just going to take z n. So, uh, and the eis are going to denote the standard basis. Uh, example 112 is that if we take the first uh, what do you call that? 
um, it would be like the analog of the first quadrant and first octant, but in Rn. This one is self-dual. It's easy to see. And then um, we can see that we just get this. The resulting semigroup using this correspondence of doing a chi to the a tuple of integers uh, of non-negative integers be identified with the corresponding monomial that is the product of the variables with exponents, those same integers, identifies the semigroup algebra with the polynomial ring in n variables. And then when does the step of passing to the corresponding affine variety, well, the affine variety with that coordinate ring is uh, affine space. Very good. I'll remind you that that's what goes in the correspondence. You pass to the affine variety that has that uh, algebra as its coordinate ring. Now, let's take a D that is smaller than N. And like inside Rn, we are going to take the cone generated by the EIs up to D. So an example would be that in 3D, we will be taking, for example, this over here. Then what happens? It is not so bad to see that when you take the dual, I mean, it is direct. You need to have these EIs. But for these ones, basically, you, in the other coordinates, you can have anything. So um, it looks like what we see over here. Then if we pass to the corresponding semigroup algebra, these guys uh, give us the allowed exponents. Then we see that on the first d variables, the exponents must be non-negative, but the exponents on the other ones can be any integer. And now we can see that you can see that this is basically the tensor product of this polynomial ring, tensor product with this one over here. So then you can see that this is a product. The corresponding variety would be a product, but then Let's identify it. For this part over here, it's just affine space. And for this part over here, it's a torus of dimension n minus d. So then what is happening is that the corresponding affine variety would be this affine space product with this guy. Because I remind you that when you have this tensor product, uh, the corresponding affine variety would be the product. Very good. Now let's take this smallest one. Uh, you have sigma is zero, then the dual is this one, then the resulting semigroup would be, we did this one in two dimensions a moment ago, you get all of this, and then it follows that the corresponding variety, I can identify this, this is a localization of the polynomial ring in n variables, is a localization at one element, of the polynomial ring in n variables. So it's going to be the affine set that I get in my affine space of dimension n by removing the zero set of the product of the variables. Ah, we know that one. It's this guy, the torus. Very good. One more example over here. Maybe in the interest of time, I'm going to let you, you can look at that example, uh, maybe in the exercise time later on, just so that we get to section two today. Our final task is to prove that the name is not like cheating. Like it's, uh, we said that it's a toric variety. So then let's check that is actually the case. Maybe I'll go a little bit uh, quickly over this part and outline what goes into that proof, because I think it, allows you to understand a little bit of the is structure that goes over there. So say that we have sigma, a strongly convex rational polyhedral cone. And we take the affine variety associated to it. We are claiming that it's a toric variety of dimension n. The word normal is already there, but I'm keeping it to emphasize, to emphasize that this one is normal. So by Gordon's lemma, the semigroup is finally generated then we know that we get a surjection from the polynomial ring in as many variables as the generators, simply mapping the variable x sub i to chi to the power m sub i. 
That's the map alpha. And the map beta is induced by an inclusion that we had a moment ago, that these guys live in here. In, well, these guys live in Zn, so it gives us this inclusion. But then, now we can pass to the dual picture, and this gives us morphisms of the corresponding affine varieties. For this one, the corresponding variety is the torus. For this one, the corresponding variety is what we are calling this of sigma. And for this one, it's just affine space. Since this one is uh, surjective, this one is what we call like a, a close embedding. And so this one is isomorphic to the image, which is closed over here. So it's defined by some ideal, which we are calling I. And this map over here, one can check that uh, this one is an open inclusion. That will happen during the proof. To understand the map B, B, uh, beta star, this one over here, note that by the proposition, uh, this one has dimension n, uh, because it's strongly convex, because the original one is strongly convex, then we can pick up n0 in the relative interior, well, in the actual interior of that one, because it is full dimensional. Certainly, Junior. Certainly. Very good. That one comes from uh, this one over here. Very good. So then the point is that maybe let me skip this technical point. It's just a very easy computation. But the point is that it allows you to put this guy in a localization of this one. Then that means that this one lives inside this one as an open subset. That's the point. Then we have the torus as a Zariski open of our, the one that we are claiming is a toric variety. So it's a great start. Then, since we know that the dimension of this one is n, and this one has an open set, well, it's an irreducible. Uh, I already put the word irreducible in variety, but let me emphasize it. It's an irreducible variety. So the dimension is the same as the dimension of any of its open, uh, non-empty open sets. And we identify one with dimension n. So now we know it's dimension n. And this map over here, used by the construction, one sees that has this form. Very good. And then uh, the map, one can see that it's injective. Because with these MIs, you can recover all possible. I think it's, it's an easy argument. Let me skip it. And then one checks that the action of CN extends to the whole, um, extends like this. Then we have the torus as a open subset of this one. And then the image is closed, and we have an open subset in there. So, and then there is a lemma from topology that if you have like the, but let me skip that step. But the point is that you can check that. My interest is to get to lecture to the part of section two. So, in that case, I'm going to skip a couple of steps. But one checks that um, the closure is this V of I, and then we. It follows that this V sigma is stable under the action. And then one now needs to prove that it is normal, meaning that these guys are integrally closed in their fraction field, which we identify from the fraction field of this guy, because um, we have this inclusion of domains over here. So our situation is that, well, we have this structure. This guy is this, but then it is this intersection. So we are reduced to check that each of these um, is integrally closed, where those VIs are the minimal generators of sigma. And then this is the situation. In that particular case, 
one works it out. Just choose coordinates, choose a z basis, and then this one is exactly this. And then this one over here is a UFD. It's a localization of the polynomial ring in variables. Then it's a UFD. And the localization of one element of that one is a UFD. And then, um, then the same is true for this one because they are isomorphic. And these UFDs are normal. So this one is an intersection of normal ones, so it's normal. Very good. So we have checked everything. So this satisfies all properties in the definition. So indeed, it is a toric variety by the definition we gave. So that was a little bit fast. And I skipped some steps but just to give you an idea. And the reason to want to do that is because these con uh, conclusions over here are helpful. In the above proof, if you analyze, we just uh, it gives us a way to think of this variety V sigma, which is as follows. It must show up somewhere in the proof. I, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing yes. But if you want, I can think exactly what is used and I can let you know. Yes. So, in the above proof, we get fixed generators of the semi group. And then inside the proof, we constructed a surjective morphism from the polynomial ring in R variables to this guy, to, to, um, to the algebra corresponding to the semi group. But a surjective morphism of those domains gives you a map of the corresponding varieties in the other direction that is a closed embedding. So this is giving us a way to put our, uh, our varieties a close, uh, as inside uh, affine space. But also over here, we can see the torus inside over there. The Sarisky closure of that um, gives us V sigma. So one could think, well, one way to get my variety is to take this n mice that generate the semi group, consider the image of the torus, and take closure. That's what this is saying over here. And then an important result is that say that we have what we define as affine toric varieties. So are this an affine variety that has the torus as an open set that has an action of that torus on the whole variety that extends the action of the torus on itself. We just gave a procedure to get one of those out of a cone. What we are claiming now is that all of them arise that way with the word normal. If uh, we include that in the definition normality, Every affine toric variety, normal, arises from a cone that way. And then uh, if you don't put the word normal, this is what we'll be saying, that your um, toric varieties that are affine arise from this construction if you put normal as part of the definition. Very good. So I now would like to pass to um, this section two of the document. And now we are going to start with a, related to what Jonathan was asking a moment ago, we are going to consider some collection of cones called a fan. So the goal of this section two is to define a fan, then associate a toric variety that is not necessarily a fan anymore to the fan, and then we are going to discuss the basic properties of toric varieties. So let's start. We, up to now, starting with a rational polyhedral cone, uh, strongly convex, we associated a V of sigma. And now we are going to glue together those guys, glue together some affine varieties in a way that we are going to still have the torus inside and we are going to still have an action now on the whole variety. How is this going to happen? We are going to introduce the concept of a fan. This is going to be a finite collection of cones as before. So what do the cones satisfy? They are strongly convex, rational, and polyhedral. And then now, uh, if we 
Ah, I think for some one of the things that happens, uh, we can discuss it. I think that things go wrong with um, without asking for a strongly convex idea. The, one can see maybe that the torus lives in, doesn't live inside because then zero is not a phase of the dual. That's what goes wrong. Yes. So if you have, for example, I, I, we can we should discuss this some more. But part of the issue is going to be that not having the torus inside because you want zero to be a phase of yes. Anyway, let's, um, because that's the thing, like, when you have a tau phase of sigma, we get an inclusion because between uh, the variety associated to u tau to the variety associated to u sigma. We want zero to be a phase because zero gives us the torus and we want the torus inside. That's what goes wrong. We can talk about this some more, but that's what goes wrong, really. Okay, so our cones are nice like this. They are convex and rational polyhedral. We want that, this is our requirement to call it a fan, that if you have one already in your collection, and one, you have a face of them, then it is in the collection as well. Informally, like you can think, oh, it's closed undertaking face. If you have a cone there, all faces are there as well. And the last one is that they intersect nicely. What do we mean by that? The intersection is at faces of both. So we will not have something that I'm going to fail, but at least try to draw over here. So this is an attempt at a poorly drawn 3D cone. One of the cones in the fan could not look like this, where the intersection of those two guys is something if you look at my attempt to draw over here, um, is this which is not really a face of one of them. So this, no. They are supposed to be nice as before, strongly convex rational polyhedral. Those guys are supposed to be, the collection is close and they're taking face. So for example, if this blue one is in there, this ray is in there, this ray is in there, this ray is in there, and the origin here is in there as well, and these two-dimensional faces here are in there, and then, and so on, and the whole, yeah, anyway. And now they don't intersect badly like this, they intersect nicely, the intersection of any two is a face of both. Very good. And the idea of this is that a fan encodes the information needed to glue together all the V sigmas for sigma ranging in your fan. Glue them together to get some nice uh, topological space that is even and um, algebraic variety. And not just that, it's going to have an action of the torus, and the torus is going to live inside and the action extends, the action of the torus on itself is going to be an actual uh, toric variety. So this is um, how things are going to happen. Let's start with the fan. And let's suppose that we have a cone and a face. So, yes. Oh, please, I'm very sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, can you go back one second? Yes, certainly. Um, now that we're talking about intersections, like it's clear that like, all of these, uh, these uh, cones have to exist in the same space. Um, do we have any notion of like, uh, isomorphism of cones in case we want to talk about like them more generally? Like, yeah, like certainly, for example, we use that all the time. Like you can use like uh, G, L, uh, Z, N, and then you can change, basically change bases and, and see your cone somewhere else. And then the varieties that you get would be isomorphic. So yes. So yes, certainly. There is that that you're pointing out. Very good, so let's see what happens when you have a face of one of these cones. So tau is a face of sigma. People use this notation. Tau is a face of sigma. Uh, sometimes they make this like curly, but anyway, let me not make it too curly over there. So if you have a face, then the semigroups are contained did I 
miss of the order over here. If you have tau that is smaller, no, I'm fine. If this tau is smaller, its dual is bigger. So then I, um, I think I messed up here. There is a typo. I need to fix a typo. Just ignore this. But what we really get is um, if a cone is smaller, the dual is bigger, then when we intersect with M, the semigroups are contained. I may have written it here accidentally in the wrong order. But yes, it, it's like this one. It's like this one. Ignore a typo. Induces. So let's pretend it didn't happen. So let's go back here. Forget about it. So, oh, hello. Yes. Uh, if you have this face like this and you take duals, you see that it's easier to now be the greater or equal on the smaller one. So you, the, the dual gets bigger. But then, just that gives you an inclusion of the semigroups, then that gives you an inclusion of the algebras, just looking like this, and then that gives you a map of the varieties the other way around. So now this is fine. To understand this map, notice that the following happens. Uh, the faces, by our definition of phase, are defined as there is a half space that has the cone on one side and the face, tau, is the intersection of this boundary of the kernel part with the cone. So then we express it like this. It's just the definition. And then one can show, it's um, very easy to see, that the semigroup for this one, which is bigger, is just bigger in this way. Um, if you add minus m, where m was chosen as above, now they are equal. That's uh, it's an easy computation. Then it means that if these guys give me the exponents, and to get the exponents from here, I only need to add a minus m. That means that I make these two algebras equal if I localize at this guy. If I invert this element, now these algebras become equal just because of this, that keeps track of our exponents. So this is why it should have circling, I'm sorry. These guys become equal after localization. And this one is inside. What is the point of all of this here? We have just seen, oh, OK, if I have a cone and a face, and I look at the associated varieties, I get an inclusion like this. I mean, I get a morphism, first of all. But it is induced by a localization map like this. If you're not familiar with what happens in that case, you can see like, in the background of the notes, uh, shows you that in this case, you get an actually an open inclusion. This one is included as an open set. That's what happens over there. So what we are saying is, OK, if we have our collection of cones, and we have one that is a face of another, and I look at the associated varieties, the one of the tiny cone leaves as an open subset of the variety associated to the bigger cone. Huh. And I have all of this collection of cones that many are faces of others, or they fit nicely in faces. So we can use this to glue them. Right? So um, if you have two cones over here, two cones in your fan, by assumption, their intersection is also in the fan and is a face of both. So the variety associated to the intersection leaves us an open subset of this one, but also leaves us an open subset of the other one. OK, then I can glue the topological spaces, and I can also glue the shifts to get like varieties. I, I can glue this guy. Well, in principle, I get a space that I need to still check, 
some condition called being separated to really call it a variety, but I will come like in a couple of slides. At least I can use that common open set to glue them. And if now you look at the whole fan, meaning not just two cones, you can play the exact same game. Take any pair, any pair intersect on a face of both, take the affine variety associated to the intersection, leaves as a face of both, sorry, as an open subset of both, glue them along that. And in the background, it is described that when you have exactly that structure, you, well, there is an assumption about a like, co-cycle condition that if you go from this one to this one, and from this one to a third one, and you go from this one to the third one right away, those are compatible. With that assumption, you can glue all of these affine varieties and get, there is a claim here that needs a proof, that is an actual variety. Because when you glue, well, for example, you might have seen taking affine space and you remove the origin and affine space, say A1, like just the line with the origin and take two copies of A1 and in each of them you have the open set that is just removing the origin. And then you glue those two things. It's, an, it's a traditional example that people see. Take two copies of um, like C and glue along C minus zero. So you get something that would have like two origins like this. And one can see that doesn't satisfy the, uh, the definition of um, algebraic variety that one gives. Uh, it's still nice and, and all, but it misses that part. So we are, what we are claiming is that we don't have this type of bad behavior when we glue these guys. And that would be um, checking that when you map with the diagonal to the product of, the, of this with itself, the image is closed. We can check that later in a future slide. That's what would be missing to make it an actual variety that doesn't happen in this example. And if you have heard the word, it's uh, called being separated. Okay, so then let's go back for a second. What happened in this slide? In this slide we said we have a fan which is a collection of cones that is closed under taking phase and any two intersect on a face of both. And we said, if we take one of those cones, sigma, and we take tau, a face of that one, we get the corresponding V tau inside V sub sigma as an open set. Then we glued along those identifications. We take two of them, V sigma and V sigma prime, we look at sigma intersection sigma prime, we look at V sub sigma intersection sigma prime, it is an open subset of both V sigma and V sigma prime, glue them on that. So that's what is happening here. So we define the abstract variety that we get, um, X of sigma as just what we obtain by gluing. As of now, we are cheating a little, well, maybe a lot, it's a little bit because it's true, using this word. We have not indicated that it actually happens. There is something to show. Uh, is this theorem? Like, is this word? This is what could be going wrong. The other properties of variety are automatic over there, but when you glue, this one can go wrong. So let's go and see. Uh, so I was mentioning that this one was just obtained, X of sigma is obtained by gluing these affine varieties along this common open subset. And then we are going to check that is a, that we are not cheating when we call it the variety associated to this data. Okay, so if you have sigma, we get these ones are affine varieties. Very good, so at least our X sigma is covered by affine varieties. It's a great start. Uh, now, if you take the cone zero, we're even saying it's a toric variety. So we're showing a lot in this one. If you take zero and you do the process, the dual of zero is the whole Rn. 
Now you intersect with Zn, so you get Zn, and you pass to the semigroup algebra, you get uh, complex numbers, x1 to the plus minus one, xn to the plus minus one, then pass to the associated affine variety is the torus. And zero is a phase of every single cone. So the torus, the torus lives as a phase, sorry, as an open subset of each V sub sigma. Not just that, there is this compatibility. If you go from one to a second one and to a third one, is the same as going from the first to the third. So this T lives as an open set once you glue them together. So we are fine over there. At least we checked that this Tn is an open set of this one. If you take closure of this one, what happens? If you take closure of the torus, x sub sigma, x sub sigma is covered by all these v sub sigmas. And here somewhere is this t. If I take closure of t, I certainly get each v sub sigma, because each one of those was irreducible before. So I get all the v sub sigmas in there, so I get the whole x sub sigma if I take closure of the torus. But a closure of an irreducible topological space is again irreducible, so our s x sub sigma is irreducible, which is part of the definition of a variety. And some people might also use that word without irreducible, but here in these lectures we are using the convention and the word variety includes the assumption of irreducible. Okay, then we check that Tn is an open set and is also dense because it is dense on each of these, so all of them would be when, uh, in there when you take closure. So the whole x sigma would be in the closure of T sub n. Okay, now this happens. Tn acts on each v sigma. That's what we were doing before. But the gluing is compatible. So we can define an action on, x of, on the whole x of sigma, take a point, it lives inside one of the v of sigmas, and then use the action that happened inside that v of sigma. And then a person says, no, but I like their v of sigma prime, because notice that your point is also in v of sigma prime. No problem. Look at the, this open subset that is v of sigma sigma prime, and then check that the action is the same, and it does, because all of this comes uh, from the level of semigroups with all the inclusions like all the diagrams commute. So then automatically, the action that you get on V sub sigma and on V sub sigma intersected sigma prime is the same because it all comes from the level of semigroups where all of these inclusions, uh, including like twice, is the same as including at once. So all diagrams commute. So then we get an action of the torus on this guy. We're doing great. This one is an irreducible topological space uh, is covered by affine varieties. It has the torus inside, and the torus acts on it, and extends the action of the torus on itself. Why? Because just restrict first to a v sub sigma, and then now restricts to t. But then what happens is that restricting to v sub sigma and restricting to t, that last step, we already know that the action on v sigma restricts to the action on t itself by multiplication coordinate wise. So then we are pretty much done. We are missing to check that it's normal, and we are missing to check that it's separated, and this uh, theorem will be proved. So now it is normal, because normality is a local property, and when we glued x sigma, is still covered by the v sub sigma. Sorry, a, yeah, there is capital and lowercase. They are all called sigma. x sub capital sigma is covered by these open sets. And each one of these is normal, so then this one is normal as well. Now it's just checking that is uh, separated, and then we can do it as follows. So being separated, the, the definition is, uh, well, without going to a technical definition of like, a, let me just say like this, you need to check that this diagonal map has a closed image. Then let's go and check that. 
This reduces to checking that we take a cover of affines over here, these b's and b's of sigmas. What you need to check is that when we have the map from this intersection over here, that map is a closed embedding. So we want that this one is isomorphic to a closed subset of this one. That happens if I look at the map at the level of coordinate rings, which goes the other way around, what we need to check is that this one is surjective. Checking that this one is a closed embedding is equivalent to checking that the map of the coordinate rings of the corresponding varieties over there being a closed embedding, sorry, being surjective, the corresponding, uh, the cores coordinate ring of this guy is this. The coordinate ring of this product would be the tensor product of the coordinate rings of each of them, is these guys. So we need to check this one is surjective, but then, because we understand the structure of the semi-group algebras so well, it's enough to check that I am able to do that at the level of the semi-groups, right? at the level of the exponents that I see in my monomials. And that comes from checking this equality. And it's not too bad. Maybe I can put it in the exercise section for this afternoon uh, so that maybe you can discuss it with Javier. This one is like proposition uh, three in like Fulton's um, Toric Variety book and is like, not bad at all. The, the rough idea is that you have your sigma over here and your sigma prime over here. Then what one needs to get is a u is getting something like this, getting uh, something that at the same time defines tau, um, I'm calling this one tau, sigma intersected sigma prime on both. So there are u's that by product define the phase uh, tau on sigma. There are ones that define the phase tau on the other one. One checks that one can choose it simultaneously. Like, we can choose the one of these, um, it's intuitively true, and it is actually true, that one can choose one of these like half spaces, uh, defining on one side the phase tau in one of them, and then defining the phase tau in the other one. That's the exercise that one needs to check. That one takes care of the surjectivity. That surjectivity takes care of this one being a closed embedding. That one takes care of this one having a closed image, which is being separated and then now the argument is complete. So what did we do over there? That if you have this nice collection of cones, they are close undertaking phase. Any two of them intersect in a phase of both. Out of that, we get affine, um, open, affine varieties. We can glue them. And what we get is a toric variety. These ones are already in the word variety. And we are putting them for emphasis. We are saying that we get a toric variety. That's really the content. We get a toric variety out of this. Then, very good. Let's work out some examples. Uh, if we take sigma inside Rn, sorry, Nr, which was again just like think of it as Rn, and we take all faces of your cone. For example, if our cone sigma looks like this, what we are say, saying is, hey, take this ray, but this, take this ray as well, and take this ray as well, and take this face here, but also take this other one, but also take the one in the back, but also take the whole thing, the whole sigma, and also take the origin. What we are saying is that from that particular, that's a fan, and out of that you get V sigma. Is not so bad to see because what happens over here is that there is like a maximal one. And then we have a collection of affine varieties, and all of them leave us open sets of the bigger one, of V of sigma. So when you glue, you get back V of sigma. Basically, if you glue x with an open set u, along u, you get back x. That's what's happening in this example. But it's a, I think this is useful later on. 
So the funds for P2 and P1 cross P1, we claim that it is these two over here. So this one, how many cones do we see over there? I see of dimension two, I see one, two, three. Those are the uh, three two-dimensional cones. Additionally, one dimensional, I see this fourth one, this fifth one, and this sixth one. And additionally, uh, zero dimensional, I see this guy here. So there are seven cones in that one. And we claim that out of that, you'll get P2. And out of this one, we claim that you get P1 cross P1. How many coins quickly we have over there? Two dimension is one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. Are these last four are the one dimensional. And there is one more over here that is the zero dimensional. OK, very good. What are we saying now? The one dimensional cones are indicated. This is just like one would imagine. These are the one dimensional ones. And these gray ones are the two dimensional. So then like um, quickly a word of how you would see that for the first one, you get P2. Uh, remember that the cones were like this guy over here, this guy over here, and this guy over here. I didn't color them for a moment, so you can see the stuff that is written. So this connects to a question from a moment ago, this isomorphism of cones. Notice that for the first one over here, the algebra associated to this take dual, and take the algebra associated to that, that cone is self-dual. So the dual looks also like the first quadrant. The associated variety is uh, the, the associated algebra would be the polynomial ring in two variables. The associated variety would be a copy of C2. Out of this one, we get C2. But now you change coordinates. These two guys are a basis of Z2. So in a different set of coordinates, that cone is just like the same as this one. So this one also gives us another copy of uh, C2, the complex numbers 2. And this other cone, the same situation. These two guys are a basis of Z2. So after I change coordinates, I am just looking like at this cone. So the variety that I get out of this third cone is also a copy of C2. So this is gonna, these guys are going to be three copies of C2 glued somehow. And then what is the somehow? One can see over here. Um, one takes dual of this guy, this guy, and this guy. They look like what I wrote over here. You use this identification of chi to the i, comma j. Identify that with x to the i, y to the j. And then we get the algebra side of those guys. So for example, this one would be the, for this, the one below, we get the algebra generated by one uh, y inverse, x, y inverse, inside inside this one. x plus minus 1, y plus minus 1. This is the algebra that you get. And then, as I was saying, these two are algebraically independent over there. You can see that this is just a copy of C2. But then you can do the same dual picture for these guys. Like, take this ray do dual and see what you get, and I'm writing the answers over here. Work it out for each of those. For this one, you get, um, I omitted the C in front of everything to make it like easier to, to see. It would be like, um, I mean like, I omitted this everywhere, like, let me erase them again, but you're just omitted, so it's slightly easier to read. So you get this guy over here, but if you work it out, this would be like the tensor product of polynomial ring in one variables with this one over here, but this gives you a copy of C, and this gives you a copy of C star. So we have three copies of C squared glued. These two are glued along this. These two copies are glued along this. These two copies are glued along this. And not just that. I didn't write the coordinates, but we know exactly what they are. And Inside, we have the one for 0. If I take the dual of 0, I get the whole um, R2. Then intersecting with Z2, we get Z2. Then we get the torus 
what are these happening over there? It's taking, what is that black thing? I don't know. Anyway, so you have the torus over here. And then you see this becomes the familiar picture that gives you P2. Uh, one can see, for example, here, I'll, I'll take the question, please. Um, so you mentioned that like, the connection in the intersections here is gluing. Is there any kind of inclusion happening? Yes, like all of these are like inclusions of open sets. Like what looks like on one open set inside the other ones is like uh, affine varieties that live inside the other ones as open sets. And I wanted to point that out, that, that it is quite nice that if you want to understand P2, you just see this picture and it's giving you, oh, like I understand P2. It's like I have one open set coming from this one and an open set coming from this one, one open set coming from this one, glued along an open set coming from this one and an open set coming from these two glued like that way, this one glued that way, I mean there is one like this. So you get an open cover of P2 and you can write the coordinates for each one of them and see how you patch, pass from one patch to another one. So you get a very nice understanding of the P2, but like P2 is easy to understand. But um, the claim is that we could do this exact same thing for any other uh, collection of cones that fit as a fan. So we will get a complete understanding of the variety that we get out of this, like so much that then you are able to compute everything for that. You're able to compute Chow groups, cohomology groups, describe these like cones that people study by, rash by rational geometry, like pseudo-effective cone, nef cone, and all of those things are well understood. Resolution of singularities is very well understood in terms of the cones. So it's a very nice source of examples because you get varieties for which we can compute like uh, pretty much everything we like. Then uh, I wanted to point out one thing that maybe is helpful uh, because we're saying this is just the usual picture of P2, but what do we mean by that? Like say that we have like three coordinates like x0, x1, and x2, the homogeneous coordinates on P2. And then you have three patches that are where x0 is non-zero, where x1 is non-zero, where x2 is non-zero. And in that one, if you remember, those are isomorphic of C2. And what are your coordinates like? For example, in one of them, they are x0, like x1 over x0, um, x2 over x0 for one of the patches. For other patch, it would be like dividing by x1, say x0 and over x1 and x0 over and x2 over x1 and for the other one let me write over x2 so it will be x0 over x2 and x0 x1 over x2 check that you can make these guys do that like for example take x as this guy and y as this guy so then you say here y inverse Oh yeah, that guy, that guy is, over, I mean like, if I make, say y as this guy, then you, you hear CY inverse, you see? And then if we make x as this guy, then compute uh, x, y inverse should be giving us, um, do you mess up? No, no. Oh, this is fine, fine, fine? Yeah, right? Very good, like, I mean like, yeah, this is the claim that you can, the usual way to describe P2, uh, we are cheating the claim, like this is really P2. And you can do the same for P1 cross P1. And yes. Then now, like, uh, oh, more time. Thanks a lot. It's a great time to stop. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Yes, like um I think we're gonna see it. Yes, we're gonna see it. So what we is it's a question I can answer right now. We are going to have a, one of the lectures is basically about that. And those the cones arise this way. They arise uh let me do the the easiest one to see. Um, take the square and then take the cones that you, directions that you see out of here. Directions that you see out of this vertex, directions that you see out of this vertex, directions that you see out of this vertex, and take the dual of those. And, and if you see, 
you get these four cones. You get this one, this one, this one, and this one over here. So a uh, fan that I get like that produces a projective toric variety. And it's if and only if. If you have a projective toric variety, there is some polytope out of which I recover the fan with this procedure that I outlined. And one of the lectures is going to be about this topic. Thank you for asking. Yes, please. Maybe I can go over there to be able to, so you don't have to talk so loud. In what space does it live? Uh, yes, in, in yes, if the, yeah. I was just going to say that is the dimension. Like if my if it is an n-dimensional variety, I'm starting from these ones in R n, and uh, emphasizing this that even if we are working over the complex numbers or any other field, this part is over the real numbers, and it would be R n if that if that variety over there is n-dimensional. They match. <coughs> Very good. Thank you. Yes, I, I, you will be fine. You will be able to, okay. yes, yes, thank you. Any yeah, many, many will, you will receive like that. Like, it comes as a quotient of something. You just know that you are in a real vector space, and that would be completely fine. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot.